how many know what the concept of an Easter egg is? Right, well, I'm going to give you two of them. So would you please put up the first Easter egg? I'm, there are actually three presentations. I'm not going to do two of them. My team, let me give you kind of a background. I have five decades of experience in counterterrorism, counterespionage. I've started the master's level programs at five different schools, including University of Maryland, George Washington University, Townsend University, and Utica College most recently, and now Kansas State University. The reason I went down to Kansas, which is a question I get every once in a while, is that it has a laboratory for unmanned aerial systems. And as we're going to soon find out, that cybersecurity has a very big part in unmanned aerial systems. They're called SCADA systems. There's actually flying SCADA machines. And I'll, I think I'm going to attack a couple of items, but let me show you what we're going to give you as presents before a long-winded uh, presentation. Wynn warned me about long-winded presentations. Being a professor, that's very easy to do. <laughs> so the first one is 559 slides. You're not going to see that. I'm giving that to you. But it has all the details that I'm not going to give you tonight. The second one, and that is a, uh, one about sense and avoid, and the 12 major issues of risk. Part of the jobs I do with some of the companies I've owned is to develop risk relationships and risk lists for the homeland security on critical infrastructure. So there might be as many as 500 various attacks and required defenses on critical infrastructure, and we put them together qualitatively and quantitatively for risk. The second one... Yes, that's, I think this is it. Let me see if this is working. Hang on a minute. The first one that you're going to get free, and the links, by the way, you can stream this. This, is, this can go internet if you want. The, the first one I'm going to give you is, is, uh, covers three areas. It covers the market. And the market, this is only a, about eight months old. And the market now has changed. I saw a statistic just moments ago. Well, wherever my phone is moments ago that says the two interesting statistics. I, I came up with an estimate of about 80,000 UAVs on the market annually for commercial purposes. I'm wrong. According to the FAA, it's 406,000 since December. This was also the same report that changed the levels of our, which we'll get to in a minute, the level of action. The second thing is how many people actually register drones and where? Well, it turns out that that statistic you heard just a moment ago, the 21 versus 400, in Kansas, nobody wants to register. They're farmers. They couldn't give a damn about registering. If you're in Philadelphia trying to work the porn business or if you're in Arizona trying to work the, the drug business, by the way, drones are really good for drugs, or if you're in Syria, I don't think the Syrians right now are doing a very good job of registering their drones. <laughs> All of the ISIS people here on our land are not registering drones, and I'm going to show you what they're going to do with them, and you will really not like what you see. At any rate, this particular one gives you three areas. Please enjoy it. It took six of us some long work and lots of estimate. The market for small UAVs, also the FAA, which has hired us to take a look at what regulations are needed. They have an information security group, which sucks. <laughs> Frankly, it's not an information security group, it's a coffee clutch. <laughs> and I've been asked to help them with information security. Well, they really don't want to address this. They're doing their very best not to address security because it's hard. And they would rather have the judicial system take its place. If the judicial system will just give us a few decisions, we'll then tell you what the security needs to be. Okay? And let me give you a perfect example of that. The Kentucky case, just recently, there were two others. This is where a drone went over the house of a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist said, You're, I have my clients come to my house. All right, he lives in a gated, secure area. They pays for that security. Remember this for a moment. So a drone comes over his house and he says, I don't want you, to, I don't want anybody to know who my clients are. He went to court and sued. That was his first effort. They said to him, what are you suing for? The security company has used the drone, are using the drones, which you signed the contract for, to protect you. He says, well, I don't want my clients to be known because they're in for psychiatric care. And the answer came, are they able to, draw, to, to drive directly into your garage and move from your garage directly? No, they park on, on the, on the uh, outskirt of the house. Then anybody could see them. 
Drone or no drone? He lost the case. All right? He doesn't stop there. He shoots the damn drone down the next time he sees it and gives them this excuse that his daughter happened to be seen, which you heard a little earlier. Well, the rule became interesting. The judge at that point had to go back nearly 70 years to the only known drone case at the time that said 83 feet above your house, you won't. Anything below, from 83 feet below, is your, you're protecting your property. It used to be, just until recently, 500 feet was the top end of it. The FAA, with its one few rule, one, one set of rules, said 500 feet, it's a felony because you're shooting down a plane. Got it? So it's the wild, wild west between 500 feet and 88 three feet. So you have to measure before you shoot the drone. <laughs> All right? So he shot it down with a shotgun. It turns out that it was somewhere, according to the people, about 70 feet. So he got away with this. Except he's liable for damages to the drone. It's a tort. But he doesn't go to jail because he didn't shoot down a plane. Well, that didn't stop our boy. The next thing he did was buy a C-41 drone killer. A drone killer, which you probably have seen, where you can sit up there, shoot it down. It's basically an electrical pulse of, of radar energy. It's not very strong. It's about 10 kW. But guess what? It's not a gun. And because in the state he was in, they had gun laws that are oppressive, and the Second Amendment, along with the Fourth, is under attack, he was able to mention, he said, I did no harm to this property because it was, uh, you know, looking at my daughter. He must have quite a daughter. But looking at my daughter, again, all right? The third case is most interesting. We found out several facts. He didn't have a daughter. <laughs> the second thing is an EMP gun is illegal in this state. You see where it's going to go here? The third one is it was at 89 feet. Now, how the hell they knew that between 70 and 90, unless you have some way to measure this. And I doubt if he went up there and took a ladder, you know, and measured the thing. But somehow... Using geometry, they came up with 89 to 90 feet. So now he's in the wild, wild west. But by using an unsanctioned gun, he has now committed a felony. Oh. But the drone, and he owes $40,000 for the drone. <laughs> so in three cases, he has established some law for us, just to show you how fun these cases can be. All right, the next one, please. Whoops, Martha, hurry up. This one's a freebie. You have the link to it. It's approximately 347 slides. It's a lot of work, but remember everything, like information everywhere takes time and can be updated, and it's the best we could do at the time. The second one is 547. This is very new. We just finished this one. Bring it down. Oh, I can do that here. This has the, I'm sorry about the background. It looked better when we did the old, the old one. But at any rate, you're going to be seeing in this one SAA. The key to what I'm going to be talking about in just a minute is sense and avoid systems. Sense and avoid systems are the heart and the gut of all of your UAVs, and it's the easiest to attack. And unfortunately, it has, or fortunately, it has five particular areas that we're going to discuss in this one. I'm only going to take on four. There are actually 12 issues here. I recommend you get this one. It's got a, a great deal of work. Lots of pictures. I'm not going to waste time with pictures, since I only am down to 25 slides in the last one. Communications area, critical control systems, navigation, payloads, intelligence, and so on. So this is, this is the second Easter egg. Now, before we start, I need to can point out a couple can things. Go, can you go back to so the first one of it, please? Which one are you looking for? The first slide, slide the second second Easter egg. Next one before it. This is a national critical intelligence estimate. We do these on several of them. In fact, I've done them on the Iranian tax, on Egypt, on Turkey. On the America, which was even more interesting. I haven't done one on Sweden yet, but I think I'll give my students that. <laughs> that could be very interesting. But anyway, we develop risk-associated issues with critical infrastructure attacks and then find the appropriate ways to defend them. In this case, this has to do with unmanned aircraft systems, all right, and the five critical areas around sense and avoid. I'm, I apologize for the blue screen. It worked better on ours. And this is free. You can go ahead. The only thing we ask is attribution. Give us attribution to myself and my team. <clears throat> All right, let's go back to the, let's go to the new one now. I have to tell you that I'm in total, and I love hunts. Uh, wait a minute, let's put that differently. I, I appreciate that, I don't get, you know, go the wrong direction there. Hans is one of the smartest people I know. 
At the same time, I am 150% against unmanned ground transportation. I'm betting against them big time. I got money on it. It says it's going to be a total failure. I'm usually right on some of these. I made a lot of money going against things. You're going to have great success in UAS. You're going to have even more success, but little in a limited market, but a huge money success in underwater vehicles. Rescue, I'll tell you where you're going to get them, because I went to the Navy and did this. Underwater vehicles are good for rescue. They're good for mapping conditions. They're good for what are called pre-positioned material, meaning a laboratory's out at sea when a, when a, a vessel uh, goes bad. You want to have somebody close. You don't want to be calling in the uh, Coast Guard and so on. And uh, mine laying, of course, and then you also have wire transfers and communication systems. But the one that the Navy was interested in is, I told them, I sent them a proposal that I could stop Russian torpedoes. Using cyber technology and cyber weapons, that got them interested. Okay? And they're, they're, they're funding that one. They didn't fund any of the others. They fund the, fund the weapon. But I get to do all the research, you know. With. The unmanned ground transportation's got a huge group of people behind it. Amazon, Google, you name them. Watch their stocks. They're going to lose their asses. Or I'm going to go down, and I'll lose mine. <laughs> but here's why. Do you know a single human being, human being, that will allow you to take your wife in a car that has an automatic driver? Think about this for a minute. Backseat driving for women is exactly what is necessary. <clears throat> Backseat, and what woman will trust a man driving that no longer has control of how fast he's going, what turn he's going? I got news for you. How many are married? How many have a wife saying, slow down, get in the right lane. Did you see that guy over there? Hey, wake up, man. Who are you talking to? Stop looking to the left. Drive closer. Slow down. Drive talk. <laughs> okay? Can't do that in UBT. Think about it for a minute. We're just not going to trust our lives to something. We don't even like flying anymore. And you have a pilot at least. So you may, I, I'm not with the UGT side. Let's get started. This is only 20 slides, but they're compressed. I want to talk about the problem. And let me see if I can see this a little better so I can show it to you. The risk of success to, this is about UAVs, air defense systems, and down at the bottom is what I'll be going over. The risk of success of terrorist attacks against air defense systems is going up, big time. And why? Commercial UAVs. Commercial systems are much more available, much more heavy, much more intelligent, greater payloads, and the sensitive void systems for collision avoidance are quite significantly improved. Everything's better for cheaper money. You can get a, a commercial one now as low as $600, quadcopters and so on, all the way up to about $2,000, which is still within the range of, of, the, of the dollars, if you will, that are completely armed. Who? Everybody. I want to give you how we look at this thing. The, the Ryan Nichols equations have been used in the Department of Defense since we created them, I don't know, at least 25 years ago. And basically what it says is that risks equals threats times vulnerabilities times impact divided by countermeasures. It's a qualitative, it's also quantitative, but most of the time qualitative, and it can be used either logarithmic or otherwise. You have legends of risk. Low, medium, high is the simplest one, of course, but that's, there's a lot more than that. If you recognize that it's state zero, that means the time of the attack, that vulnerabilities in a system are always there. By definition, a vulnerability is a system failure or a system loss. Doesn't mean a threat will go through it. It just means it's there. So it goes out in the equation by derivatives, meaning that at state zero, at that time, the vulnerability is there or not there, it doesn't matter. Similarly, impact, like 9-11, what was the impact of 9-11? Well, before the attack, nothing. After the attack, huge, billions. But the point was, the difference was at the point of attack, it's state zero, it's zero. So you have a risk as a function of threats divided by countermeasures. That means threat goes up, risk goes up. Countermeasures go up, risk goes down. Fairly straightforward, and you can qualitatively look at it that way. That's how we look at it. In terms of setting up our list of which, you know, 20% risk, 30% risk, 40%, and we always look in three categories. 
Worst case, best case, probable case. This is not un unheard of. So we want to look at SUAS, the small ones. We want to look at something called collaboration, which you heard a little about. We want to look about um, how SAA is such a key to the threat side of it. We want to expose something I call SCADA. Now, SCADA has been around since 1941 and even then before that. I think it was around when I was talking to Lincoln. <laughs> and I once said somebody earlier, but they didn't know who it was. <laughs> Hey, Lincoln and I were discussing this. You know. <laughs> anyway, I want you also to take a look at some of the cyber attack vectors that are available through a small UAS. And then lastly, what are our conventional types of defenses? So if you can read this, and I can too, I hope, the landscape is, we'll start off with collaboration, conventional vulnerability, I'm sorry, uh, automation, collaboration, conventional vulnerabilities, countermeasures, commercial UAVs, and then the SAA systems. Okay, so you heard about automation. You saw some wonderful pictures of automation and how the levels are. The first two, slave and automated, basically are available in every small UAV. You can buy them for about $600. The second one maintains orders and can receive orders, but it doesn't have a flight mission plan. Level three adds the, the navigation capability and a little bit more money, 20 grand, basically. And here are some examples, microdome, fly with sense, and microcopter, and so on, the dragonfly. What you have here is a mission plan. Remember that one, because that exists now, and when I talk about swarms in a totally different manner, you will soon see that this is a dangerous copter. Levels four and five you saw in the pictures. Basically, these are either almost fully automated or decision-making artificial intelligence. They don't exist. They exist in laboratories. At Kansas State, we do this. Uh, we also are engaged in taking down drones by a variety of methods, which we'll show you four of them. The, the point I'm trying to make is they perfectly don't exist, but there's a lot of money, as you saw in the previous thing, going into this kind of, of research. It won't be long. I would say we're within a five-year planning period, and you'll see some fully automated stuff, which goes to Wynn's conversation early in the game that we need to outlaw. I don't think so. We need to change governments. <laughs> well, whoever. We need to change gun. <laughs> because right now we don't have the right answer to anything. So, let's go here. What is this with drones? Well, if we're looking at Hamas, they have 200 drones in a fleet. If you're looking at Hezbollah, they have nearly 1,500. But you hear things like the drone guy that went across the White House gate. <laughs> right? But I'm telling you, Hamas has nearly 1,500 in operation. That would scare me more than the little silly character that tried to go over the fence. Okay. So how do they collaborate? Or do they collaborate? Well, the answer is under an isolated condition, they don't collaborate. And the countermeasure here is to shoot it down, disable it, take it out in any way you can. Sometimes that's pretty expensive, by the way, and especially if you're in a civilian area. Using a missile in a civilian area tends to piss people off and you get some collateral damage. A group is just an isolated group with no necessary chief, no, with a pre-programmed plan, meaning I'm gonna attack this house. I'm gonna send four or five of them to attack the house. Same type of thing, if I can shoot them down, I can track them, I'm gonna shoot them down, I got it. We get into a new type of thing, it's teams. Now this might be 50 or more in a team. The difference with teams is it's like the military. It's got a hierarchy, there's a chief, and each one has a section, but you can take out multiple targets. In the Skies Project, they took out six targets at the same time. By the way, in, in Australia, New Zealand, and the United States at the same time. That's impressive, using satellite and MSAR tech. Um, the thing is, if you can get rid of the chief at the head of the snake, you got the team. You may not get all the targets, but you got the entire group under control. The last one is swarming, and swarming can be at any level, and you can track these guys. They don't have, have a chief. They come up on radar, but remember these guys are starting from about a mile out from your target, just like the special ops guys, okay? About a mile is a pretty fast response time. Now, when we were doing nuclear studies, it was never 10 seconds. Well, it was 20 miles for a high 
The current nuclear study still says about 26 minutes before we wake up to realize there's a nuclear attack on either side. But technically, the pushing the button is 10 seconds. But the swarming here has a global strategic view. So if I shoot down 25 of them out of 100, so what? They're still coming. And think about it if it's a nuclear plant. But better yet, I like the attack that, that Wynn brought up that I haven't done yet, and I will, is I'm going to attack some of the old universities that I didn't like. <laughs> Just think what we can do with, a, a, say, 40 drones coming in on, you know, Harvard. I think I can show those assholes real quickly what they're worth. <laughs> I went to Tulane. We were the Harvard of the South. Right. Okay. So there are some conventional thinking. This is the conventional. We'll get to the asymmetric in just a minute. Early detection or danger close. Applied inappro uh, appropriate, sorry, appropriate countermeasures with the goal of restricting collateral damage. The latter one's tough. It's not that I can't hit the drone. I got lots of stuff to hit the drone with. Problem is, where am I shooting from? If I'm in Baghdad, this is a real big problem. If I'm in New York City, it's a bigger one. Some of our nuclear studies said that if, uh, if we drop some nuclear material in the middle of New York City, I'm going to destroy the city. No, I'm not. I'm going to create a mass of fear. It's not a mass of destruction, though well, the bomb, whatever the bomb does, but the radiation is mass of fear because time, distance, and removal are the defenses against radiation. And most things, but it turns out what, what the ISIS guys are doing, they've got the medical, that's strontium, strontium 80 and T exactly. No, give me a second. Oh, here it is. This is, by the way, from one of the foremost experts on radiation. Let me, give, let me make sure I get him. Professor of Physics, Radiation Safety Officer, Dickinson College, John Lutzenschwab. Lutzenschwab. And what he says as potential sources, by the way, there's alpha, gamma, and, and beta. Beta is the, alpha is nothing. Well, that's not nothing, but it's nothing. And in terms of penetration, beta is a little worse, but gamma is the one that's the dangerous one. And he basically says, fatal dose being 500 rem. By the way, where did they come up with that? How many, uh, I, when I came to Pennsylvania, I came up, uh, I found, when I was buying my house, the fellow asked me if I wanted to split the cost of radon. How many have heard of radon? Well, coming from Texas, there is no such thing as radon. Never heard of it before, so I thought it was a scam. So I let this character get away from me for 2500 bucks, and then I found out from a paper, newspaper article, that I was in a high section of radon. Well, radon's at the level, according to the Environmental Protection Agency, which we all trust with our hearts, <laughs> is four. Four is the considered the federal level. And when they measured mine, it was 64. So I had to have radon remediation, which, by the way, is about $20,000 added to the cost of the house. But they did it to 4.2. So I called the state and said, you sent me a bummer. They didn't do their job. And they were forced to come back and drill 16 more holes in my ground. If you've, ever, if you've had any of this happen, put up a huge thing that makes noise all night long, like a helicopter. But it's down to 0.4, and they paid for that. Mm -hmm. So you can use the federal government against themselves if you try. You know. Anyway, the um, I'm getting there. Plutonium, 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 cesium. Here we go. Medical facilities, cancer therapy, food irradiation, 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 sorry, sterilization. Cesium-137 and cobalt-60. That's what it is. Unfortunately, that is 30 years, five, 30 years to five years on half-lives. That's nasty stuff. And it's mostly gamma. So you're right. That's, that's bad stuff. Okay. That's correct. There we go. So the question is, how do we stop these guys? What are the current conventional ways? And one is active, active radar, okay? And the other one is passive. The active is basically a estimation of distance, approach, uh, uh, speed, size, and penetration, and then taking it out with some weapon, missile, 
Nerf gun, whatever you like. The, the other way, though, is now looking at it from an IR, from radio waves, passive communication, meaning I'm going to track you, but I don't necessarily have a way to deal with you. And unfortunately, that's what we've spent our money on. That's where we're spending our money on, the passive all over the... We've got lots of passive stuff. They have subnets that'll tell you where the Russians are going all the time, but that doesn't mean anything. That means, oh, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Oh, they're still coming, they're coming, they're coming. They've now sent off their missiles. Oh, they're coming, they're coming. Okay. And interestingly enough, some of the Hamas people have found ways to use counter-countermeasures. Now, when, when I was working with this stuff, there were three levels. There was, first of all, electronic operations. Then there were countermeasures of what was CM, and then we had CCM, which is no longer called that. It's called recovery. Those were the most secret things you could get because that was what you would do once you knew you were being painted in an airplane. What would you do to recover? What would you do to send out a different kind of signal? Okay. So what are the goals here? Incapacitate, destroy the threat in a direct way. Another one is the efficiency of these things. These small UAVs come at you within one mile. That's the general rate uh, level. One mile. That gives you a response time of less than three minutes on a, on a general. It's coming at you at about 130 miles an hour, something on that order. Passive protecting, physical protection, target decoy, shields, organized roadblocks, jamming, and so on. Down at the bottom here, you can see the aggressor countermeasures that we were talking about earlier. The current crop of small UAS are measured. There are lots of models. They have various levels of, you know, four, six, and eight variants, and so on. Fixed wind for basic, fixed wing for basically uh, for weather, uh, hard, not hard weather, but uh, for agricultural. We do a lot of that out of Kansas. But you're interested in flight time, payload capacity, range, weather hardening, weatherproofing, imaging, and the programming ability. Those are, your, those are your parameters. That's what you have control over. Isn't it interesting that all but weather, everything else, is the same parameter of SCADA? Isn't that interesting? So, we're going to look at four of them. And again, I've got to get to a point where I can see this a little better. I didn't realize it was, it was that difficult. The uh, sense and avoid system has five groups. Communications, critical control systems, intelligence, navigation, and payloads. And these are the A to D issues. They're not all covered in this particular one. But here are, the, here are the groups we did take a look at, and we'll just we'll touch on them, and then I want to go into a discussion. Spoofing GPS. We've done this a lot. That's how the Iranians took down our RQ-170 back in 2011. That's how we took down two of theirs. Unfortunately, they sent ours, they sent ours back as a model, if you remember that story. Mm-hmm. Kind of insulting. Corrupting authentication. Uh, authentication authentication, sorry, of ground station. Um, and the, the one that we work on now is chips. Where are all the chips in the United, the ASICs, all right? Uh, field programmable chips and also application-specific integrated circuitry. Where are they all coming from? What's the problem with that? And guess what they did with it? They put their own control software. Does anybody remember the ELINT control over London? They took down an ELINT plane. Think about that for a minute. One of our electronic intelligence planes. That's scary. And how did they do that? They put it in the ASIC chip for the cryptographic communications. That's scarier. If they have control of our cryptography or can bypass our cryptography, what does that mean in a UAV? We own you. We own you. So another one is if you're in the plane and you're a pilot, you're interested in broadcast. One of the ways that you know where things are, remember these are very small generally, and out there, where they're back in the back of the kitchen, you still can see them, but a mile and a half away, a UAV is practically unseeable, except for radar or electronic mode. So uh, one of the things you can do is spoof or jam the broadcasting. The critical control systems are SCADA, and that's where we'll stop in this presentation. And we're down to about half of it, so I can get into the, the conversation. Um, other places we looked at are the intelligence area, navigation systems where we spoofed the navigation using weather. One of the most interesting the things we came up with is because weather is completely, uh, completely unencrypted, 
comes in as a text contextual format, who says I can't put something in I want to? That's exactly what we did. We told the UAVs that it was in the middle of a tornado. What is its response? Land. Well, it first goes to its flight path. It's, it, there are two emergency waypoints. Generally, there are at least two that says, okay, if something goes wrong, you lose your signal or something like that, go here. And wait until it returns, until it recycles. If that, then it goes to the other one. If it doesn't work there either, then it says land. Yeah, yeah. But what happens when I send it some bad weather data at the same time, control its SCADA system, which is critical control, and say, I want you to land on my pad? How does it know that's bad data? It doesn't. In fact, it's accepting the weather data as valid. It's coming from the U.S. government. Everything in the U.S. government, of course, is true. Payloads, and that was discussed by Hans very well, but basically you're looking at things like spoofing, jamming, and malicious code. If we're talking about the critical control systems, what are they? Well, movement, landing, control of direction, detection, correction. Good. <coughs> then they have the seven design parameters. How does it move? Detect, track, evaluate, prioritize, and so on. You've seen these before, I'm sure. The auto, let me see if I can give you a picture rather than keep going on here. No, I can't. All right. I took all the pictures out to get this down to 25, Win. Got <laughs> all these nice little pictures. Let me go to a picture where we, I know I have one. There we go. This is the ground system. I can attack the air, the ground, the satellite, the UAV, the critical. Let me kind of give you an idea how dangerous the SCADA system attack is. I got in a little trouble if I hadn't been doing it with permission. Um, I worked for the Defense Threat Reduction Agency at the time, so we were involved with lots of these checking, you know, critical infrastructure. I came up with a SCADA attack on HES oil. HES oil has a huge set of oil refineries, several and so on, uh, millions of gallons of capacity and such in their tanks. And, and being an engineer, I found a way to turn all the valves on turn all the alarms off, and do this during the fog. Now, the, generally, the foreman shack is how far away from these, these plants, the, these um, uh, silos? Two miles, three miles, four miles. So you can't really see what's going on. You're literally based on the trust of your SCADA system uh, GUI, you know, what it's telling you to do. The alarms are off. I've now turned out 8 million gallons of oil and 6 million gallons of gas and 3 million gallons of flammable VCM, vinyl chloride monomer, into the Chesapeake Bay. Approximately 16 million gallons in eight and a half hours. It destroyed the crab industry. It destroyed 850,000 jobs. The estimate was $6 billion of mistake, if you will or $6 billion worth of payload destruction. It was a simulation, by the way. <laughs> and I gave them that, they went black. They literally closed off the, the doors, took your telephone, and going black means that they can take your telephones, they take your everything, all the pages and stuff, and they're all black, right? What's fascinating is that this convention center had about 600 people in it, and I thought they were all technical guys like us, you know, or at least people interested, but not necessarily <laughs> anybody in the food chain above, you know, level. I was wrong. And I'm talking, he says, continue, I had a colonel next to me, and he was my liaison. He says, go ahead. And it's completely dark, I can't see anybody. Suddenly, the damn wall started talking to me. And about this size, some guy says to me, what do you mean I got to shut down all the computers on our navigational systems and everything else on the goddamn submarine, says the wall. I said, yeah, if you want to protect yourself against skate attacks, it's exactly what you have to do. Are you sure, he yells. I said to the colonel, who the hell is this? He says, that's Admiral so-and-so. He's in charge of the submarine fleet. Yes, sir. I'd be more than happy to go over this in detail. Next, the wall came over here. And he gave me some kind of strange question. I can't remember what it was, but it was just this, you know, very authoritative kind of guy. And I looked over and said, who's this guy? Assistant Secretary of Defense. I said, who are these walls? They're talking to me. Where are they coming from? Apparently, we were live everywhere. 
And so I had quite, I've never talked to Walls before, but it's a very, you know, you go home, but you need a drink after this. It's really, it's really a weird thing. Anyway, SCADA systems are quite in interesting in terms of damage that's possible. Why? How many have a car? Come on. How many have a kitchen? How many do their wash in a laundry, right? Or in your own laundry? How many have a telephone or cell phone? How many have a computer? Am I getting there yet? Every one of these is controlled by a SCADA system. And they've been controlled for seven decades. And guess what the security level is on SCADA systems? Well, it's not quite zero, Close to. but really, really small. Let's put it that way. A lot of these are technically not SCADA systems. They're embedded systems, they're real-time systems, they're process controllers, but they're technically not SCADA. Supervisory control and acquisition of data systems are the supervisor. So everything you named has a supervisor. And those systems are, in fact, SCADA systems. They may be very limited to SCADA no, systems. No, no, okay. I call them a SCADA system because they act like a SCADA system. If it walks like a duck, sounds like a duck, it is a duck. But I agree there are some limited... You're talking about the limited sections underneath in real-time analysis, and I agree with you. At the same time... The overall system, if I can control so the... conflating remote terminal units and process control yes. units and ladder logics and yes. uh, C language programs, you can't lump all that together. And from a security standpoint, there are at least three different areas there that have completely different security profiles. Sure. It's so a lumping problem. it all together is not, is not a good way to think about the security of this area. Maybe. I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you after. Well, I think you, that's not necessary, but I'll be more than happy to talk to you about it. <laughs> uh, let's take a look at it the other side of the coin. If there's no security on any of those three, what does it matter? If I have a dollar change in quarters or dimes, so it's still a dollar some change. degree of security on most of those. Uh, it's not that's... adequate security, it's not very good security. Yes. But okay. The difference is the age of the underlying system. Yes, the older the worse. Well, not necessarily. No, 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 well, the legacy no. systems tend to be the easier ones to attack. Many exceptions. For instance, <laughs> a lot of the this is what I love. This is good. Are, are are programmed in Ada, and they're now rewriting them and updating them and programming them in C plus plus. And for those of you who know yeah. about buffer overflows, and right. Ada, <laughs> right. you know about the difference between C family languages and Ada. This is like a terrible thing to do. Uh, to, to industrial control systems. And, and, and at one point they were using right something called APL, too. America on a large scale. Yeah, one, at one time they were using APL, in fact, if you recall that one. Remember that before Ada? No, Yeah, it was a matrix form, if I remember it. But, but the point is, the vulnerabilities in the programming aren't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the level of protection in a supervisory system that is designed for open communication, all of those systems are, that are designed to talk to each other, they're more interested in the GUIs, the graphical interface to the, the fellow at the, at the panel, if you will, in the, in the foreman shack, who's controlling these things. That's what's interesting. He's not concerned about the internals. If I can turn off the alarms to him, if I can, if I can in just basic information security, if I can change the integrity and availability of the idea, I've got him. And I don't care what the doggone hardware so it looks like or the software looks like. I don't even care what the theoretical side of it looks like. If I can change the data, which we do, if I can make the system do something that it's unexpected, if you will, from the operator's standpoint, I have them. And that's what I'm talking about. If I can insert data through the weather system, which is normally, remember, we don't have a pilot looking now. We have, at best, we have a ground system looking at maybe a SAP system, one or two, the ground system. At best, I'm telling the UAV that it has weather data. It's coming from known weather, um, trusted sources. It comes in text. It's non-cryptic. All right? It's picked up by the UAV as, oops, wait a minute, I'm going into a hurricane, even though there's no hurricane. So by definition, whatever the pre-programming in any language, I don't mean to yell at you, in any language, whether it's APL, C++, or COBOL, or Python or anything else, it doesn't matter because the system's going to react and say, I'm in the wrong place. I got to get out of here. And what is my emergency response? Go to a waypoint. Or some, some don't even have those. The, the smaller commercial ones have nothing in there. It basically says, and goes, and dies. 
What you're really trying to do is take control of these guys. And to take control of them, like the Smart Skies Project, is you want to have control of some particular parameter. The one we found that's the most easy right now is weather. The other one is GPS, of course, GPS spoofing and, and jamming. And there are lots of ways to get to that, but it's not the RTU that I'm looking at. It's not the CPU that I'm looking at. It's not the ASIC for hash number three. It's not the, uh, any parts of the, the input or output system. All I'm doing is giving a phony, unauthentic, unauthenticated, cryptographically pure piece of data, which it assumes is true. And if it's true, it's going to work on it. Well, we we're talking about trust. The, Does that make, wait a minute, does that make sense, my, my suggestion? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Just a minute. Does that make sense, what I said? Yeah, yeah it's true as far as it goes. The okay. terminology, technical terminology you're using was incorrect, but your main point is valid. We can agree to disagree on that one, but the, does the concept get across? Because in practice at the, at the laboratory, that's what we do. I think we're all aware of this concept already. I doubt there's anybody here who needed to pull that. You've got an awful lot of clocks in there. Where's time in this equation? Um... Yeah. Well, you've got. It depends on where this where this coming from. If you're like coming from a satellite, you've got latency. Yeah, but you've also got standards to give you system on measurement. So you can account. Which measurement? I'm sorry. Which measurement are you talking about? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, th there is latency involved. If, if you're right next to it, the latency is very small. Open a window. You can cope with it. But my point is, time must have a really strong value. Dennis is one of the gods of application security. <clears throat> Fundamentally, we're looking at something I think has been glossed over because a lot of the guys that did the time standards are dead. They're okay. not there anymore, okay. and the youngsters haven't picked up the value. I'm aware of at least three times where to breach secure ID, GPS time was moved. Okay. And if you're a good secure ID administrator, time is fundamentally good. So my question for your systems there, what value is a good quality of time? I think it's a fundamental. Oh, it is fundamental. In fact, uh, my students have come up, and I, I haven't, my students have come up with everything from a 17-second latency factor all the way up to two minutes, depending upon where the source of this thing comes in. If I've got a satellite, if I'm going through a satellite and bouncing it back, I can have a very heavy latency. That's of real value to the attacker. That's a real value. If I'm right next to it and we're flying on the pad and maybe within a couple miles or something like that or we're up to say 15 remember the, the level of some of these small ones only stay, stay up there for 18 to 20 minutes we're not talking about long-term kinds of evaluation i would say a few seconds in scott's space of economics there are real-time examples of trading for using that sort of patents good tell me about them i'm, I'm interested really important space i think we have examples do you, uh, I'm well, sorry. It, it gets down to really fine, we're not talking about seconds, we're talking about people who are using, who are, who are buying microwave dish so they don't go up up in the air at all to, to shave enough fractions of a second, enough milliseconds to get the trade. So you're in the milliseconds at that point. Making, and that making gives huge you amounts of money sure. at, a, at a millisecond level. Okay. So it's quite extraordinary. I agree. Um, I haven't found that because our, we are in a much more gross or rough of, of, um, of, uh, but are you? Because that's part of the equation you've not made this good value. Our problem at first was bringing them down. We were trying to find the concept of how do we bring these things down at any level. Our second one is what were the, the primary risks? You know, where, where do I have the highest risk? This, the time scales that you heard me talk about are not relevant. Well, we're they're, talking they're, about they're trying to fine grain for, yeah. for what? So they're part relevant. of the equation. But an autonomous device should have the capability to value its time source. Well, I couldn't well, agree we, more. We have a whole family of attacks. If, if you look at that matrix that you we just to, released that are all time source you need uh, to share. corruptions, we, we figured out how to do havoc with messing with yeah. Also, you know, I think what we're talking about is that we're setting technology incorrect, but there are lots of attacks that have been to that. Oh, yeah. Well, there you're trying to explode the system. I'm actually trying to control it. I'm trying to get it down. I own it. We can bring it down. Yeah. My, my favorite. Well, bring, but bringing it down to use it again or bring it down? My favorite is, it, it is attacking radar systems by sending code into the radar receiving antenna, which we're taking it in, thinking it's 
going to be a, a radar, radar bounce back. And that's why we can actually feed. We can actually feed. Yeah, that's, code. that's and that's cool. why attack that's vector ma matters because the attack vector you're really talking about is a protocol violation. Right. Yep. Where you're using the protocol against itself, and it's just as important to factor in practical or you know lower level Absolutely. concerns as well Absolutely. because they can have the exact same effect Absolutely. as a protocol. Well, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So we were talking about when we dropped the bound rate on serial. Okay. So a space bar at 9600 bar would be okay. interpreted as a break control at 20 bar. Okay. So if you can do that sort of thing in this scenario, you'll kill it every time. Uh, I have to tell you, we have not looked like that. We've been more concerned. We've identified it, but that wasn't well, our I would, prime. I would, I, would, I, would, I would just kind of argue that there's a, there's a different level of elegance yeah. in sending specific data, which, were, which is incorrect, which causes a correct interpretation, yep. which leads to your desired output. Right. I suppose. Right. 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 So, but you would need to know, so for your, in the example of saying you're in a tornado, you would hopefully know what that would do, or you would just do it to see what it did. Well, if it's an right. aircraft, you'd add an anonymous, and say the word someone, I can't, two okay. pieces of wire to Yeah, but I mean, right, so you've got the drone, you if you know that that particular drone is programmed to do certain things at the tornado... Well, we had, you know, we had a lot of control yeah, over this. In fact, right. I said that. That's, that's actually a key point, because the drone doesn't know it's in a tornado. The drone has right. a set of rules, and right. we can look at those rules, and, and we, can, yeah. we can manipulate them. And actually thinking about things like tornadoes is really a distraction for a hacker. A hacker wants to bypass the concept that the thing was programmed to do and take advantage of what it was really, what the yeah, code yeah, really yeah. says. And that's where it matters... To, Really, the whole attack strategy, whether you're dealing with programmable logic controllers or RTUs or just what level of protocol you've got. Some of those give you very narrow operating range for messing with things. If you've got a ladder, lo ladder logic, is beautiful from a security standpoint. And that's another example where replacing something that's from a security standpoint is beautiful with now so-called programmable logic controllers that you can write C code into. And they're bad from a security standpoint. We're going backward all over the place right now in control. At the very point at which the hacker world has made this its chief focus of interest, this is where the talent yeah. in the hacker world has been going into the last few years. I Nobody's agree. been interested in botnets if they're a smart hacker in like years and years now. It's yeah. all yeah. different kinds of embedded really systems. Well, it's like using right. it's like using malware uh, malware programs that are based on one signature. The word elegant. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that some of the most practical attacks can be the most elegant as well as protocol attacks. Oh, okay. Elegance is in the eye of the beholder. Ubiquity of attack, how easy it is and where you have to be to accomplish one of these attacks is usually the biggest driver because you know the economy of the attacker is affected there. So that, I think, is a component of the elegance. Okay. Our, el our elegance was at a qualitative and a more high-level type of thing. We were looking to see if we could rate, rate the risk levels. Which ones were worse than the next kind of thing? Which one had a bigger payoff? Uh, one of the presentations earlier talked about optimizing cost. We were trying to optimize risk in a sense, lower the, the risk. And then be able to make a taxonomy, what we found, and give that to FAA, who would ignore it, and give it to <laughs> Homeland Security, who didn't ignore it. So if CIA, our, our authority, I've completely contact with them, do something sensible, if we've done this, we've got ideas from last year. That value to say, well, this is how they're doing it over in the UK. That gives you value to fight a case. More than happy. I wish I was a god in this, but I'm not. My job is to provide a valid set of studies with some limited resources. Students who have to be trained, and we'll bring him down to help us with the skater systems. But you understand, you have limited resources to do the job, and Kansas State is very limiting on its yeah, on its fine. resources. The universal time standing That's correct. has only come about as GMT because of work done in the civil aviation. And it's still fundamental, it's always been. Not taught. I, I couldn't agree with you more, but we have, weren't at that level of detail. That was, that was taken into account, but, uh, but assumed more than anything else because we had the parameters we were looking at were different. And, it, and that doesn't mean that it's wrong, that means that's the next thing we have to look at. Dennis is your man with his own watch for it. Well, maybe he'll give us some money. Can I, can I ask a, a clarifying question about the model that under which you did this study? Did sure. you uh, assume a white box or box attack software? We assumed a black box. Basically, we assumed a black box. 
I guess. Plus, mentioned. plus we had control over what we were putting in each one. We had an aerodrome, we had a a, a Cessna 168, and so on. We we knew what we were doing, and we had control over as much as we could control. But they're all within a limited range of the field, and the field is what five miles. That's not across country. That's not taking satellite data and so on. Yeah. Another thing we had an assumption. That Swarm oh yeah, you don't you care about that at all. Right no. Yeah. Our our job was to see whether we control it, take it back, and in theory, then we had control of and do with it what we wanted is, to is do. That because of current law, that you have no, no, that was just our that was just our design methodology. There was there was no instruction to do this. Nobody said you can't do it. We had permission from the the ver from the airport and permission from the FAA. We have a license. You got to go through all kinds of licenses to get this stuff. But uh, nobody said you must do it this way. No, it was. They were more concerned with we have a. Here's a, here was how it started off. We have a budget of X amount of money, which is classified, but X amount of money, and we need to know if a drone attack hits a particular national critical infrastructure. And we had seven of them. They gave us out of the fourteen that they were concerned with. Uh, one of them was navigational. Another two, you can figure out which ones they are. They're not that typical. What would be the top? 12, 15 attacks based on a drone system that we should concern ourselves, and in what uh, ranking, even though they couldn't get, we had no data other than qualitative, not quantitative, there's no quantitative per se data that we could develop fast enough to give them, but qualitative, you can, you can do a delta approach, you can take a look at it, you can, there are lots of ways to get to qualitative if you, if you see the risk, in, uh, the risk improves with a particular threat that you have some. So you have a qualitative one, basically, uh, much more difficult than low, medium, high, but that kind of thinking. And so the answer was, give me a taxonomy and a list. That was the project. And so there were limited things that we could do. There's a lot of things I'd like to do. And I'm adding the time one in the back of my head right now, and I'm expanding it to EDU, and I'm expanding it to a whole bunch of other things that I've heard here today. But got it. So my problem is I have funds and, and students who are going to graduate, which means that we have to go through the whole process of studying, they're not 100 percent. You understand? If I got short terms, generally I have them in a master's for five courses. That's what I got, and so I have to work within that time frame. I don't, I don't have, and I'm not paying them much either. You understand? They're they're getting a grade that basically they're quite good, uh, and they're they're as sharp as can be. But at the same time, we have our limitations. So, I have a quick question. Good. I'm, I'm go ahead. I'm I'm on my last uh, minute here. Uh, like the new drones that are coming. Right. No, because the swarm is a is a, a group of a lot. Right. Without a chief, so they're basically fifty of those. Right. But they don't care. So, but if you're damaging them, so let's damage fifty of them. Out of 100, let's damage 50 of them. Fifty percent's a big hit. You got 50 that are going to go on target, and nothing's going to stop them unless you have the global view of where they're coming. You know they're coming at you because you can see them on radar. They have their radar active, but at the same time, unless you have a particular global defense that can change and get them all, which you've got 50 of them, then what happens to the other 50? They don't have any minds. They just they do the thing. So I don't think so. If you could, you could be making. See, going back to that Russian container, we've currently got projects produced for our name. Oh, sure. The capability to manufacture these, you just throw them away. They're making five or ten thousand beyond the realm. Well, we saw some there with the what they call the nano, the nano robots. I mean, those. How much does it cost to make those things? We might be able to make a couple of dollars each. But the problem is the payload. How much payload can you put in that other than a camera? If it's something that's going to interfere with radar, like shaft, got, exactly so. Then who's to say what the purpose or mission might be? Gotcha. If you move I agree. From there, yeah. Because that's where you'll go. I agree. Payload insertions for troops are currently 20, 30 miles. Right. So you can drop them from another country. Okay. So that's clearly what you've got to pay for, and then you could be looking at insertion over the stratosphere 